So, very, very quickly, to introduce uh, the members of this panel, we have Sir Lawrence Friedman, who's an Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. Uh, Margaret McMillan, on my right, is an Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Toronto and an Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford. To her right is Rana Mitter, who is Professor of History and Politics of Modern China at the University of Oxford. And to my left is uh, Oliver Robbins, Ollie Robbins, former senior British serv civil servant, uh, who currently works for, I can never pronounce it, say it. Caught me the bad moment. Sorry, Hacklet. Hacklet. Thank you. Uh, and company and leads coverage of corporate clients across EMEA. Uh, we're going to talk about the global situation now, and just to kick us off with a nice, easy one. We seem to be in a time of very, very rapid global change. What would each of you think are the two most pressing international challenges that British foreign policymakers should be concerned about at the moment? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you've got to bring this war to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to see how that happens. So um, there's a lot of other important stuff going on, but uh, the stability of Europe does yep. rather require um, Russia to lose this in some way, uh, and that will take some time, I suspect. But so I think that would be that's my first. Um, I mean, then there's any number of sort of things that are going on. Mm. I mean, leaving aside the sort of the geopoliticals like China and so on, with climate change, or the coming to terms with artificial intelligence, which is one of those issues that can get hyped very quickly. Um, whereas, in fact, there's a lot of here and now challenges that are as interesting yeah. as the hype. So I, I would want to have a combination of a, of a sort of big pressing geopolitical problem, which Russia provides us, and a sort of a, long, a longer term, although the climate change one is also with us as a here and now problem, and a sort of theme as well. Okay, Ollie? I mean, I mean do raise other issues. I mean, it's not, don't yeah. all we'll agree with each other. No, no, I agree with me at all. No, well, obviously, as I suspect we all will cumulatively, I agree with everything yeah. Lawrence said, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, hello everyone, very nice to be here. Uh, two extra things, perhaps a little bit more deliberately off beam. I, I personally think, um, there is a big job to do in British political leadership to try to square resources with ambition. Yep. And mm -hmm. if you're talking about more sort of systemic challenges for British foreign policy, and, and I would put that well up there. Yep. Um, and secondly, in a similar vein, rather than talking about specific issues and international situations, I honestly think as someone who used to kind of travel for their country, um, that the kind of strength of the British economy is a, a major sort of systemic issue for British foreign policy and British foreign policy influence. Um, you know, for most of the time, as I sort of started out as a civil servant who dabbled with international things, you could, you could rest on the fact that the British co economy was at least interesting, if not envied, by other countries. Um, and I think at the moment that's a much more questionable assumption. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Well, again, I agree with my, my predecessors, oh, like, like a good Canadian, <laughs> um, we, we go for consensus. I, I see the UK partly from outside, and what strikes me is that um, two things. One, you, that you seem to have lost confidence. I mean, I think the last few years have been very hard on Britain, British politics, um, the British public. Um, and I think there's, there's a real sense that perhaps you're, you haven't had very good leadership, you've had chaos at the centre. Mm -hmm. um, there's what, there are worries about the future of the Union, um, which I think may be, with the implosion of the Scots, Scottish National Party, it may be less than there were, but I do think there's that. There's also, you haven't yet figured out your position in the world. I mean, I think it's sometimes very hard to have a great past, and I think there's a lot of <laughs> rhetoric about how we will be world-beating, and we will do this, and we will do all these. I mean, I started making a list of all the... Um, descriptions that were coming out about what Britain would be, um, S Singapore in the North Sea, technological super hub, um, Dominic Raab said that we will go, for, Britain will go from being a, a whale to a dolphin, um, I'm not quite sure what that meant, <laughs> but dolphins tend Mitting to jump. a strange noise. Brighter. Yeah, it's brighter. We'll they, be doing tricks in an aquarium. Yes, now. and then they, get, then they get some nasty <laughs> fish at the end. Um, so I do think, I think there needs to be, um, wait, I hope, a serious discussion of what Britain can be, what it can do, 
And I think some of the um, inflated aspirations simply don't make sense. Um, you know, I think, and the idea that Britain won't work with Europe, I mean, I know it's working with Europe on Ukraine, but it does seem to me, and, and also the United States. I mean, this, we see the revival of the special relationship idea, um, mm -hmm. which I don't think ever amounted to much. I was looking at the New York Times and the Washington Post on the train coming up. There's not a single mention of, of um, Prime Minister Sunak's visit to Washington. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Um, so I think two related things that follow on from, uh, from, from all those, I think, very um, appropriate comments. Um, the first one actually, I think, is in terms of relating Britain's trade policy to uh, realistically what the UK does in the early 21st century. I'm thinking there about the way in which services, which provide such a very significant proportion of total GDP, I mean, Oliver's talking about the economy there, and I think this is where it is, whether it's banking, whether it's finance, whether it is um, actually higher education, which uh, much though we often don't think of it that way, is not only something that uh, continues for the moment to carry values, both with people studying here and indeed uh, its export uh, abroad, but also, of course, is a tremendous uh, earner for the, uh, the UK when um, foreign students have some consistent idea of the terms and conditions on which they're admitted to uh, the, the UK. And that consistency, of course, is partly to do with changing domestic priorities on the question of migration, perfectly legitimate in a democratic society, but there's often not much attention paid to the fact that this is part of Britain's global proposition, which is the uh, idea that I think Anand was putting up there as well. I'd also add, of course, um, media and soft power, one of the areas where actually, again, British services have a great deal to offer in the wider world, but generally tend to get discounted because at least in some cases, the messages that those media put out are ones that for domestic political reasons aren't always comfortable for an incumbent uh, government. The other point that I'd uh, make that links to that is that in terms of the world's most economically dynamic and politically turbulent region, which we may say something more about later, which is the Asia Pacific, right now the UK is in the middle of trying to balance a whole variety of things without having yet, I think, had either a full public debate or indeed sufficient private debate about what the balance of interests are. Without going into the details now, because it's just an introductory comment, I would say Working out what we actually mean as the UK by being in the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, an important trade agreement, but one that by all consensus isn't necessarily most important actually in terms of the trade it brings to the UK, but rather because of its security implications in the Asia-Pacific region, needs to be discussed. It needs to be discussed in the context of the fact that the Taiwan question will certainly be a very pressing one for all liberal countries, including but especially those allied to the United States and indeed Japan in the, the next few years. And I would say that the public conversation as well as political conversation about where the UK fits in all of this is only just beginning. Wonderful. I mean, there's an awful lot there to pick up on. I mean, Laurie, I want to come to you first. Uh, much though it breaks my heart to promote other people's blogs, I would say that the comment is freed Substack, if you haven't seen it, is well worth subscribing to. There's some brilliant stuff in there. I was very struck yesterday, I think it was yesterday, was a new piece came out in Foreign Affairs mm. talking about basically an armistice and, and looking at what's happened in other conflicts around the world and basically saying we're missing a trick in the West because we need to be thinking about how to stop this a lot more so than we currently are. We can't just leave this to drag or it will drag. What did you make of that? And you said it's very hard to see an end of this, but can you speculate a little bit? I mean, what, you know, is there anything we can say at this point, or is it just simply unknowable? I mean, I think these are, uh, if you look at the armistice as people have in mind, they normally involve partition. Hmm. Um, and there's no way the Ukrainians are, going, Ukrainians are going to agree. I mean, the, I was at a conference last week with a number of Ukrainians and others. Um, they're furious, absolutely furious with what the Russians have done to their country mm. um, and what the Russians have done to their people. They're not going to agree to partition. Um, and also, of course, Russian objectives. People miss on this. They assume that the Russians are just gagging for a deal. They've given absolutely no indication because Putin's dissatisfied with, the, with, the, with what, what he's got. He hasn't got either Donetsk and Luhansk mm -hmm. under his control, let alone the two others, one of which is being washed away at the moment. Um, that, that, that he claimed to be annexing last September. So there's no landing point for a deal. Um, I think, I mean, my pessimism on, on the idea of a deal is twofold. First, 
A peace negotiation would take weeks, months yeah. to agree, just list the, the issues, reparations, um, war crimes, working out what the border is, um, sanctions, 10 rounds of sanctions to unravel. Uh, so you, you're not going to solve this with a peace deal. So the armistice idea is, well, maybe you can do it with a ceasefire. Um, and, you know, probably if it does ever end, it'll be a de facto or maybe de jure ceasefire, maybe with some disengagement agreement. But I think the problem for Putin is he doesn't know how to end it because when it ends, there's a reckoning. Hmm. Um, and I think it actually suits Putin to keep this war going in some shape or form. Now, whether he can, whether there are political forces that we don't quite understand in Moscow um, that will uh, say, you know, this can't go on, there's all sorts of things happening that are undermining uh, our, our long tradition, I don't know. So, I, uh, sure, we need to think about these things. We need to think about security guarantees for Ukraine, which is also difficult. We need to think about how, you know, the reconstruction for Ukraine, which is also difficult. There's lots of issues. But frankly, until Russia looks like it, it can see it as being defeated, um, I, I, I can't quite see a way forward. And even then, it's not going to be easy. I, I, I mean, it, 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 this is the biggest thing going on, um, even in my lifetime, uh, be, because so much depends on, on, on the outcome. Uh, and we're left with this problem, of, which is one of the things that a lot of these writers worry about, is how do you integrate Russia back into uh, the European security framework? You can't with Putin there at the moment. It's just a, there, there isn't an option. Um, mm. So we're, we're dependent on, on some really momentous things happening before we're going to see uh, a clear end to this. I mean, I mean, any of you chip in if you want on this, or not if you don't. Are you about to? It's just one of those things that's so worrying about Ukraine is that it will give encouragement to others who want to break international agreements, um, invade each other's countries. Um, you know, we, we are seeing already the rise of, of strong, um, mostly strong men actually around the world, um, who are playing on nationalism, um, pulling on history to argue that they have been victimized or they have an entitlement to the land of others. And I, find, I think the example of what's happened in Ukraine is really terrifying and potentially terrifying. It does continue, though, to provide diplomatic difficulties for China in particular, yeah. because China is now stuck in a position yeah. where, on the one hand, despite stated you know, neutrality and objectivity, it's very clear that Beijing's sympathies at the top level are with Russia. That's not necessarily true, actually, of, of the wider middle class in China, but that's a different question. But at the same time, when asked directly, even now, certainly in the last few weeks, Chinese diplomats have had openly to have to stick to the position that they respect Ukraine's complete and absolute sovereignty. That is a very difficult set of positions to maintain simultaneously. And China <laughs> is the only major country, you know, it's not Russia itself, that uh, is having to dance that particular tightrope. And then, if I may, just a couple of things. One, to build on something Laurie said, I mean, a, a couple of misconceptions that trouble me when I see them. Firstly, that sort of Putin is the worst of Rus Russian politics, and if, <laughs> and if only he were to move on, suddenly a sort of liberal intelligentsia would take over Russia. I mean, there is, there is the persistent critique of him domestically is that he has not pursued this war aggressively enough. And we just need to kind of be clear-eyed about that. The second is just that I think there is a, there is a sort of um, a myth here that the, um, well, a sort of understandable complacency that um, it was Donald Trump who was a sort of blip in American foreign yeah. policy and American views of Europe. Mm -hmm. I, I fear the reality is that Joe Biden is a relatively, sort of from a European point of view, likable blip <laughs> in, an, in the direction of American domestic views on foreign policy and therefore we all need to, to use Ponzi language. We all need to be thinking about our sort of 2024 US presidential hedge um, mm. because we can't count on the American position remaining as solid as it has been. And that, you know, given what Lauren says, who's much more expert than me, we need to be thinking about our, our plans and strategy well beyond 2024. And then just finally, and again, I say this in humility given the people to my left and right, but. If I were a middle-sized, slightly friendless, nuclear weapon-free country, I'd be thinking to myself, 
It mm. really wasn't very wise of the Ukrainians to sign over their nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, and I just, I worry personally about the implications for sort of proliferation strategy and theory over the next few years. Mm. I mean, even Biden, it has to be said, there's, a, there's an America firstness about Biden that wasn't there um, to the same extent. I mean, if you think about trade or IRA or things like that, it's not all glowing multilateralism, is it? No, it isn't. And you're absolutely right, Anand, but I think specifically on views of European security and Russia and Ukraine, he has been a, a welcome but coincidental uh, timely kind of refocus on that. And I don't think we can depend on that even in the Democratic Party without him. No, absolutely. No, I, I, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, yes, we have to be very cautious about what might come along in 2024. Um, you know, by and large, the Republican leadership in Congress has come along behind the Ukraine policy. Um, the money keeps on flowing, uh, the assistance keeps on flowing, uh, and it's, it's, it's a minority that, 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 want, that, that wants to let Ukraine hang. So I, I, I'm, I'm less bothered about that in the short term. I think there are, there, there are issues about, which is a, a European-wide issue, about how you prepare for your security when we've shown we're not very good at doing it by ourselves. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, talk to Eastern Europeans, um, let alone Ukraine, uh, uh, and then you know, they want the Americans to stay. They, they really don't want, they don't trust anybody else to, to do as good a job. So we have a, we have a big issue here. We, we may feel that we, you know, wouldn't it be better to have more, and it would be better to have more U European capacity, but we don't as yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are caught in a bit of a bind there. Uh, and I think I'm just on Ollie's other point. I, I agree. I mean, the, the critique of, of Russia war policy comes from the right, comes from the nationalists. That's partly because everybody else has been shut up or is in exile. Um, the people who keep Russia going are the technocrats. I mean, with, without, the, without the people who manage the economy, who've done a remarkable job for Putin, uh, it would be in an even worse state. So. Um, it's not that they're a liberal intelligentsia who, uh, you know, are, are, are embracing Western values, uh, but there's a sort of technocratic, pragmatic group in there who are desperate to see the end of this, um, but don't know how to do it, and, and are patriotic, and therefore keeping the show on the road. Mm, I mean, I'm, I'm asking the question this way just because it's very hard to look both ways at once. So. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's been a lot of self-congratulatory rhetoric around Europe about the unity shown over Ukraine, but it strikes me that one of the sort of massive flaws in this has been the failure of the West to rally what I think we still call the global south behind them when it comes to the position on Ukraine. Now, firstly, would you agree that this has been a major failing of Western diplomacy? And secondly, is there something that can be done about it uh, in terms of rallying those countries to our positions, or is that a battle that we've lost? Well, I'll start, if you like. I mean, I think there was an assumption that the, it was so clear-cut that Ukraine yeah. was in the right and Russia was in the wrong, that everyone would rally around. And I think there was a laziness or just a lack of attention paid by Western powers and an assumption that the rest of the world would see this so, so evidently. I have a certain sympathy for the position of countries in Africa, for example, who say this isn't our fight. Um, mm. you know, and we've had dreadful wars going on in Africa, which no one seems to have worried very much about. And why, just because it's Ukraine, we, we're all meant to get upset about it. I mean, yeah. you, you can understand, even if you don't agree with it, but you can understand that argument. Um, and I, you know, it is a worry. I mean, I think the argument has to be made, and was made too late, that we all suffer when a rules-based international order breaks down, hmm. which it is doing. Um, and so, yes, I do think it's been a problem, but Rana probably... Well, I think following on exactly, I mean, I think that's a really excellent point. You know, anyone who's been involved in looking at, say, you know, the kind of civil wars and actually cross-border wars around the Great Lakes in Central Africa will, you know, have exactly that, mm -hmm. that point. That's made. It was an irony, but I think quite an interesting one, that one of the actually Chinese-supported peace delegations within the last few weeks to Kiev was of six African presidents, I, I think, and I think that was done not just on the grounds one hopes of trying to achieve some sort of resolution, which clearly is, isn't happening, but also I think symbolically as well, that, that was, 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 was made very clear. Um, I think taking that point even further, um, the problem is that the belliger belligerents involved just have a very different meaning for the major global south power brokers. So 
for India, Russia is not a security menace and invader. Mm. It is a long-standing Cold War ally. I mean, India famously was the only you know, real major democracy in the world that was quite Soviet-aligned during the, um, uh, well, non-aligned technically, but nonetheless, during the Cold War period. Even now, I think something, and Laurie will know, between 49 and 51% of India's armaments come from Russian suppliers, and that mm -hmm. means also the supply chain, the maintenance. In other words, this is an ongoing relationship. Um, added to which also, the friendliness that um, India has with Russia is a point of geopolitical leverage in its own right. And of course, in addition to that, there's cheap oil flowing in and gas flowing into India, which is a country which points out it desperately needs to boost its economy post-COVID like everyone else's. Uh, China, of course, is a country that actually, unlike India, had a very bad relationship with Russia during the Cold War, leading to a, a near war in 1969 on the Asuri River. But that's long since passed. There's still, I think, a residue of mistrust in various, uh, various areas. But overall, there's no doubt that China considers it very useful to have a large and in some ways under siege um, partner to its West that shares in its entirety its distrust and dislike of Washington DC and NATO, which it regards as the, uh, uh, the greatest mer uh, menace, not, uh, not the question of territorial sovereignty being, uh, uh, being invaded. Beyond that, if you look at some of the swing states um, that are going to be involved in that international diplomacy, the kind of countries, I mean, if you think about the number of countries that meaningfully might be able to do some sort of intervention or mediation, you know, what someone like Norway would have done in, a, in, a, in, in other situations in a, in a previous time, many of the countries you come back to might be emerging powers in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore mm -hmm. to, to some extent. None of those countries, I think, have public spheres or indeed leaderships that automatically see the maintenance of Ukraine's position in the wider world as being the most important point. And indeed, I think actually the Indonesian president was recently given a bit of a roasting in the last few days by the mm -hmm. Ukrainian uh, defense minister or foreign minister um, for basically saying that they ought to sort of sit down and, and come to a, a, a ceasefire. But because overall the aim is to try and get Europe and you know, the, the world back to something that looks a bit like stability, the question of quite who has which bit of obscure territory from the Southeast Asian point of view in Eastern Europe is not going to be at the heart of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the question that they negotiate. Laurie. Yeah, I think a couple of points. I mean, the first thing, one of the few things the Global South agrees on is it doesn't like being called the Global South. Yeah, true. Um, uh, there are a lot of very disparate countries mm -hmm. there with disparate responses. Um, you know, some of the most, uh, one of the most eloquent speeches against the Russian invasion as it happened was given, I'm proud to say, by a former student of mine, Martin Kamani, who was the, who is the Kenyan ambassador uh, to the UN. Um, and I think we'll also have to be careful that irritation with the West, uh, which, uh, uh, an, an irritation with the hypocrisy of the West, mm -hmm irritation with the West casting this as democracy versus autocracy, which um, I think is now recognized not to have been helpful given that you need the support of autocracies mm -hmm. um, in all of this, which raises other questions about the role of values and so on in, in foreign policy. Um, and, and I think that there's been a careful walk away from, from that sort of rhetoric. It doesn't translate into support for Russia. If you actually look at yeah. votes in the General Assembly, Russia loses them all massively, absolutely massively. The, the countries like China and India abstain, but they don't vote for Russia. I think North Korea and, and about a few other bits and pieces vote for, vote for Russia. So Russia is still Iceland. Secondly, um, it's causing problems. I mean, Rana noted those that have been created for China, which have perfectly good relations with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and wants to be part of Ukrainian reconstruction when it happens. So I don't think China has any interest in breaking with Ukraine. And Zelensky was far quicker than the West in realizing the opportunities in the Chinese peace deal. Uh, not because it's a deal that, that will happen, but that, that, that if the principles underlying it were strictly applied, Russia would be the loser. Zelensky saw that quicker than, than, than Biden or anybody else saw that. Mm. Finally, um, it's true that India um, has a close relationship with, with Russia, but it's also starting to... First, it, it, it's agreed to buy lots of weapons f uh, from Russia, some of which don't seem to be performing very well. <laughs> Secondly, it's not getting them because Russia needs them for its own use. Uh, so actually, Russia is reneging 
on, on a lot of it, are, uh, which is a major income earner for. So it, it's a complex. I think we have to not assume that just because we're not doing very well in our conversations with these countries, that Russia's doing brilliantly. Uh, yeah. I don't think it is. Did you, were you wanting to... With apologies to John Barstow, I was about to be beside myself with excitement. I thought we'd had a question from Johnny Barstow uh, when, I read it, when I read it quickly. But I will come back to the point you make, John, in a minute. But actually, John Pete raises an interesting question, which is we talk about you know, the domestic politics of the United States, but the domestic politics of Europe creates some cause for concern, doesn't it? We've got you know, electoral politics in Austria that are far from reassuring, in Slovakia as well. We have the prospect of the next French election. Uh, do you think we should be concerned about populism and its impacts within Europe as well? Is that something that you spend your time worrying about? Because it's not just over the Atlantic that this might change things. A couple of changes of government in Europe and the, the, the EU's position on Ukraine looks very, very shaky indeed, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, I, so I agree. Um, I think I'm going to stop there then. <laughs> Years of training in answering parliamentary questions, just yes or no is normally the best answer. No, I'm, it, is, um, it is troubling. I don't, I'm not a sort of, it's not in my top set of anxieties that okay. I am, because I, I think um, that, you know, it's, it's easy to be oversimplistic about this and Laurie's just been reminding us not to be oversimplistic about sort of categorising whole groups of countries, mm -hmm. but for as long as, um, in their very different ways, uh, Paris and Berlin are prepared to come to deals and to keep the EU roughly on track, mm -hmm. uh, then I think, you know, change in Austria, uh, frankly, the change that's already happened in Italy, um, plus risks in Spain, risks in other places around Europe, they matter less than it might seem. And uh, the thing that really worries me, you, you have alluded to, which is we're actually already not that far away from what will be the next French presidential election. Um, mm. And I think another thing about which it's very risky to be complacent um, is that, you know, sort of inevitably there'll always be a runoff and, and the fascist will lose. Um, you know, there is, a, if you just sort of do a regression line <laughs> through the last three, two presidential elections, you get a sort of weaker, weaker candidate than even Macron, who's not proven himself a great campaigner, but is a very interesting president. Um, and you end up with a, a Front National president. And I think the sort of implications of that for European unity, well, across a range of issues, are, are profound, but potentially including, of course, relationship with Russia. So that, I, I think that one kind of dwarfs all the others, honestly. Um, and for as long as that risk doesn't eventuate, for, the, for EU foreign policy, um, you can sort of afford to be a little bit more relaxed about domestic political change in some of the medium-sized countries. So I suppose Italy tells us that they don't always do what you might think they're going to do yeah. once they get into power. But absolutely, you know, but also, sorry, I mean, also a very, very useful reminder that weight around the European Council table is not related to population or GDP necessarily. I mean, I, I would argue that Prime Minister. Mitsotakis of Greece is a more influential figure mm. than Prime Minister Maloney of Italy at the moment. Interesting. No, no. Yeah, well, just on, on that particular point, that of course Poland, which is one of the more authoritarian oriented states uh, within the EU, is nonetheless, for obvious reasons, uh, a great supporter of Ukraine. So the, the two don't necessarily, of course, go together. Uh, I think that one of the ways in which by the mid 2020s we're increasingly going to have to regard exactly this question is through the weight of three continents, uh, North America and Europe and uh, East Asia, because I think events in all of those are going to reflect on each other more interactively than has been the case up to now. If you put forward the following, you can basically sort of play one of those sort of um, Jenga type games, sort of substituting different uh, outcomes. But don't forget that one of the elections in 2024 is the Taiwan presidential mm. election at the beginning of the, of the year. And if you insert, for instance, a series of combinations such as um, an isolationist Republican, there's more than one winning the US presidency in late 2024, coming off the back of the DPP being re-elected to the presidency uh, in the early part of that year, um, then by the middle of the, uh, of the decade, as, as was being said, uh, you know, President Le Pen appearing in France. I think that this is one of the things that would certainly give cause for reconsideration in Beijing. 
I don't think that contrary to some of the slightly sort of overwrought discussions that have been seen both in public and in private, that um, a kind of uh, military confrontation or even a naval blockade on Taiwan is very imminent in the near future. One of the simple reasons for that being that China's economy is still absolutely focused on trying to raise growth off the back of the COVID uh, disaster in, uh, in China and everything from youth unemployment at 20% in cities to retail sales being extremely sluggish to the demographic crisis that means that there's going to be have to be a lot more spent on pensions and healthcare because China is getting old fast like Japan or, um, uh, or South Korea. All of these things mean in the next few years that launching a major military um, offensive is actually, uh, I think, a less likely outcome. But the combination of all of those perfectly plausible events in Washington and in Paris and in other parts of the continent combined with a sort of anomie about the idea of either continuing what will no doubt be a rather sort of um, uh, fragile situation in Eastern Europe, even if there's a, a ceasefire or an agreement, and an increasingly um, volatile situation in East Asia uh, might be a lot more dangerous than we, we recognize right now. Margaret. Actually, I just, well, I just wanted to add, I mean, I agree with what Rana said, but like, what worries me is the possibility of overlapping crises happening at the same time. And, and we haven't talked about Pakistan, for example, which is a nuclear power which is, looks more and more in danger of meltdown or, or mm. some real bust up, and I think that is absolutely terrifying. But there's also um, you know, always the danger of accidents, and I don't think history teaches any lessons, but there have been an awful lot of accidents in the past when things have gone very badly wrong. And I worry about, for example, you know, a, a, a Chinese and an American ship bumping into each other, which they've come close to doing yep. in, in the seas around China. What would that do? And then you get um, you know, in a very interconnected world, but also the possibility of mass mobilization of opinion, you get public opinion getting seized of these issues, and governments will find themselves, as they have found in the past, under pressure to show that they're strong, they're defending the interests of their nation. So those are the sorts of, those, those are the sorts of things that worry me. Not a single crisis, because I think those can be managed. And I agree, I think a lot of the rhetoric about China and, and, and the United States is, is completely overwrought. And when we get talk of a second Cold War, this is not helpful at all. But I worry about the, the possibility of accident and, and coincidence. God, this is turning to a really cheery little panel, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I realise I'm also chairing this really badly without any shape. We're just having a chat rather than... I mean, we started on Britain and have drifted. And we will get back to Britain, I promise. I'll try and sort of think this through a bit more clearly. But rather, I want to just... Everyone in, in Europe at the moment is, is saying they're Indo-Pacific powers. You know, the sort of the EU were sort Particularly of thinking, media. Well, yeah, uh, and I just, I suppose my, my first question for you on that is, what do countries in the region make of this, if they notice it at all? Um, actually, countries in the region have different reactions. So if we're talking about, well, first, first, first of all, there are some countries which actually have rather welcomed the idea that European powers, particularly European <coughs> powers, want to be involved in the region. I think Japan is the yeah. case study of that. There's plenty of evidence that Japanese diplomacy, Japanese you know, wider um, uh, influence and, and power are being used to encourage those European powers that want to have a presence. That's clearly, as so many things are, about the rise of, uh, of China. I think in Southeast Asia, uh, apart in ASEAN more broadly, an organization which is more concerned <coughs> with keeping regional stability and trade links going and, you know, almost steps away from much commentary on security matters. Um, the attempt to try and bring through uh, warships into the uh, seas around uh, um, uh, the West Pacific is less welcome. But there, of course, you have actually the other element, which I you know, mentioned briefly, just bring it back here again now, which is the changing trade environment in East Asia. I mean, right now, there is a very weird situation, uh, certainly compared to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, pretty much every one of the major Asia-Pacific powers had the, U uh, the United States as its major trading partner, and also most of them had the US as the major security partner. It's still the case that the US has, at least officially speaking, far more security partners and formal alliances in Asia than China does. The only one China has formally is with North Korea, and that one hasn't worked out fantastically uh, uh, well so, uh, so far. But, it's no, but there's no doubt that in the 20 years um, since 2000, the trade relationships that China has, both bilaterally with all of the Asia-Pacific powers, are you know, the single largest that any of them have because of the size of China's market, and also its growing role, both as a source of 
exporting capital, which is what the Belt and Road Initiative was about, and also its capacity, because it's got such innovative technology now produced indigenously, to actually export that. So if you're a Malaysian automotive manufacturer, Proton or whatever, you're very interested in Chinese um, electric vehicle batteries, for, uh, for instance. Mm. And that's being done through trade um, networks, all of which, the major ones, and again, feel free to contradict me on this, with the single exception at the moment of CPTPP, have China either at the heart or as a major signatory, so RCEP and all of the ones around there which basically will write the regional trade rules. China is at the heart of uh, that particular set of discussions and that's where the European powers again have the potential for influence because the Chinese would like to try and separate Europe more broadly speaking from the priorities of the United States and they see possibly with some justification that trade rather than security might be the way to do it. Interesting. Does anyone else want to come in? I mean, the only thing I'd say very briefly, Alan, for a change, is um, I did find if a sort of a word from a recovering practitioner is helpful, um, <laughs> is that you know you, one's credibility as a UK voice um, when trying to talk to other countries about how they should organise their affairs is enormously boosted by having one's own affairs in order. <laughs> um, and. Uh, <laughs> What I mean a bit more specifically in this context, in the sort of, you know, no Pacific tilt type language, is, you know, we've been talking about the tragedy of Russia and Ukraine. You know, the, the kind of the UK, the US, other European powers appearing in the Indo Pacific to teach people about how alliances keep them safe and how um, <laughs> alliances, particularly with us, keep you safe. And uh, we just need to be careful we don't come across as sort of. Um, completely sort of um, schizophrenic. <laughs> Were you surprised? I mean, I've, I've never really managed to get my head around this by how much of a political issue China became inside the Conservative Party. And just that seemed to come from nowhere. You suddenly end up with the China Research Group and mm. this variety of people. I mean, it's, it's not very often you see foreign policy becoming an issue like this. I mean, do you know where this came? Did it, were you taken, I mean, presumably you talked to these people, rather. Uh, I'm sure many people in this room talk to, to, to many of these people uh, too. I think that um, there's a variety of factors that come from the Chinese side that clearly came together in a series of issues that had to be um, resolved one way or another that couldn't be fudged. So I would say that the Huawei controversy of 2020 yeah. probably sums that up best because essentially you have two viewpoints which I think are not absent even now, and you talk about inside the Conservative Party, which you know, I have no purchase or insight into, I hasten to add, but in terms of the broader China conversation in the, in the UK, you would still have people, perhaps rather fewer and rather quieter than they would have been, who say Huawei would have been, if the UK had stayed with it, about basically having something that was cheap, effective, and showed that the UK was nimble in terms of dealing with global supply chains and making the best trade choices for itself. Um, uh, in, uh, in a post, uh, post-EU um, environment. I will point, of course, of course, to many, many other countries around the world, which, of course, are aware of the security concerns that surround Huawei, but have nonetheless, for reasons of cost and economic nimbleness, chosen to, uh, to, take, it, to take it up. And on the other side, a conversation which became much more dominant, uh, partly in the Conservative Party, but not purely um, there at all, saying that actually there is a clear and present danger in terms of a country with which you have a very difficult security relationship, providing central infrastructure for your government, for your um, health systems, for your trading systems, and whatever it might to might be. If you add to that the um, COVID crisis, which of course was very strongly linked to its outbreak in, in China, and of course for Britain specifically, although US was involved with this too, the Hong Kong crisis, where actually in the end a uh, consensus was reached both within the government, actually I would say broadly without, that actually the breach of the joint declaration, which ended with a national security mm. law, which essentially shut down many of the freedoms which Hong Kong had been uh, assured, uh, meant that the, the temperature, the atmosphere around discussing China had suddenly to move on very, very um, swiftly and very, very radically from what it would have been just five years before in the, the Cameron Osborne golden era. Just, I mean, one of the things we sort of we sort of touched on a little bit and skated around, I, mean, I suppose, Ollie, you talked about resources and foreign, foreign policy ambitions. Uh, I suppose one question, there isn't an easy answer to this. What, 
what should the UK aspire to be is the overarching question. The, sub, the, 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 the initial sub-question, I think, which is coming up a lot in the Slido, is you know, should the UK really try and work more closely with the Europeans if it wants to have weight and heft in international? Is it only a matter of time, basically, before we coordinate a lot more? Because that's the only way, collectively, Europeans can have the sorts of influence they want to have. So old habits die a bit hard, and then, so I'll give you two options. <laughs> um, I, I think, and then a third, the <laughs> Mayway or the Highway, um, and one of them isn't war with France, and so you have to pick the other one. Um, I, I would, I would say that you know the, the last few years of domestic British politics and British political relationship with the European Union have broadly, very, very crudely, left us with two options. One is to try to find. Um, ways in which we can develop a new role as a differently interesting bridge on both security and economic issues across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And I suspect, in his own way, and not using that rhetoric exactly, that's what the Prime Minister is trying to do in, in Washington at the moment. Um, the difficulty being all the time, I suspect, he might even feel it's a bit of a difficulty himself, is that the section of British political commentary that wants to portray that all the time as the UK somehow sort of winning against the EU rather than yeah. being a bridge between the EU and Washington. And of course the other difficulty being, although I'm not quite as down about this as some commentators have been this morning, that you know our weight is different now in conversations in Washington without the credibility of being able to say that we were around the table with all these characters only three weeks ago and this is how we can help you manage some of what they're doing. The other option is, is to, and, and, and in some ways is the truer sort of implicit message of the Brexit campaign, I think, um, would, be to, would be to sort of regard all of that as still kind of trapped, in a way, into Britain's old national strategy. <laughs> um, and if you could summarise it in a sentence, I think the national strategy that I and most of my contemporaries sort of grew up inside uh, was that we sort of... Uh, we, we were the sort of economic and security interpreters between Washington and Brussels. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, you know, that's trying to find a new way of doing that uh, in a, in a, in a post-EU world. I think the, the, more, the more radical view is that some of the things we haven't even yet had time to talk about that will sort of influence world events over the next few years. I mean, Lawrence mentioned climate change. We, we, we're now seeing it in real life. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's with us now, and its implications are with us. I don't pretend to understand it, but we are on the cusp of, if not now well over the cusp of, a further extraordinary technological revolution, mm -hmm. which I think has the capacity to revolutionise the ways in which economies trade with one another over the next 20 years. I don't think it's completely fanciful to wonder whether huge container ships are still going to be with us in 20 or 30 years' time. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of the global architecture has been designed by countries we still collectively call the West in order to enable the passage of container ships. Um, and so some of these factors are going to change enormously. Some of those are potentially an opportunity for a country that is now divorced a bit from some of those structures that it helped create for managing international trade and goods. Um, so I, I don't want to be completely sort of stereotypically locked into, oh, we've just got to find a new way of kind of being the common language between Washington and Brussels. It's possible that other trends and context will mean that that's a less necessary part of our national strategy. The problem is, and you know, I, Rana's point earlier about a great past, we sort of, it's, I think it's quite hard for the political class here to sort of think in that way because it does involve jettisoning some kind of totemic things yeah. that we're very attached to. Yeah. And um, if you're going to embrace that rather more risky, but potentially more interesting view of a sort of future British national strategy, I would argue, just to be a bit controversial for once in my life, I, I would argue that you know, two carrier strike groups is not necessarily the way in which you go about that. Can I, can I just challenge you on the bridge idea? I mean, I'll come to the rest of you in a minute, but I just really struggle to see how this bridge idea has any credibility at all in a world where 
we're not in the room in Brussels, mm. so actually we're of limited use to the United States as a sort of carrier pigeon or whatever we used to be. You know, we can't tell them what's going on in Brussels. If they want to know what's going on in Brussels, they ask the French and the Germans. Mm. And, you know, you have the Prime Minister over in the United States at the moment when Canada, the US and the EU have a tech forum where they meet and discuss these things already and the Prime Minister's going and saying, oh, let's set up a forum. Yeah. It's kind of just the institutional reality of where we are post-Brexit makes that incredibly difficult, doesn't it? It does, but if, to, if you sort of take, was it Eisenhower who's supposed to say, you know, plans are worthless but planning is vital. And it, if, so if you sort of extrapolate a bit from God, that, we should put it on the wall of our office. <laughs> forecasts for what's going to happen over the next five years are, are basically useless, but kind of the process of thinking through the scenarios that might occur and combinations of scenarios that might occur, as Margaret was saying, is absolutely vital. And I don't think it's ridiculous to think that a consequence of um, the security crisis in Eastern Europe is over the next five years to drive particularly London, Paris, Brussels yeah. and Berlin much more closely together again. I don't necessarily mean within the institutional structures of the European Union, but of course, a way would have to be found of relating that conversation to the institutional structures okay. of the European Union. I don't think that's ridiculous. And I do think when the chips are down, there are still some, for all that I agree with Margaret, that's sort of the language of the special relationship, if it ever had a day, has slightly had its day. Yeah. There are still some cultural and legal similarities of approach between Britain and America that are closer uh, and enable a conversation more quickly and more instinctively about some of the huge challenges facing our civilization over the next few years around technology and privacy and how societies and policies work and talk to one another that I think is an easier, quicker conversation than it is necessarily uh, between Washington and Brussels. And so I'm, I don't want to overstate this, Anand, but I also think it would be a mistake to be completely sort of okay. pessimistic mm -hmm. about our chances of being able to be quite innovative still in that space. Did you want to chip in on it? Yeah, I mean, I thought one of the worst think? things that ever happened to British foreign policy was Dean Acheson's speech in 62, where he said that we'd lost an empire but failed to find a role. And ever since then, people have been trying to find a role, hmm. a distinctive, unique, special role for the UK. And it isn't there. And the bridge idea is, as for all the reasons you give, Adam, it never made any sense. People, people want to talk to each other. They can do. They don't need us as an intermediary. Um, and on trade and regulatory issues, obviously, we've diminished our impact. But on security issues, we haven't. We, we really are still a major player in the security sphere and in the intelligence sphere. And this is a world where these two things have become much more important, sadly. Um, and you know, if, if you look at what has made... You know, if you look at Ukraine, the UK has taken a forward position on Ukraine. It has had influence. It has made a difference. Um, uh, I think it, it's one of the few uh, more impressive bits of British foreign policy in a pretty gloomy time. So we have to, um, so, uh, and that's why I'm not quite as dismissive of the carrier groups either. Um, I mean, it wouldn't have been my choice in terms of how to spend our, our, our defence money, but seeing that's how we spent them uh, and assuming we can keep them seaworthy, um, uh, they, they uh, they do have an impact, and you know, it's in Australia a bit last year, and AUKUS, is, we haven't mentioned AUKUS, AUKUS is quite important. Yeah. Um, we, we have now, not just in the, uh, in the submarine side, where we've got a US, Australia, UK plan, let's see if that plan works out, um, which is pretty dramatic in terms of the most uh, sensitive technologies being developed mm. together, but it has a second pillar, which is artificial intelligence and quantum computing and so on, which is, is moving forward. Now, clearly, the US um, dictates how far a lot of this will go, but the point of a lot of this is to ease the regulatory issues between these three countries, um, which has enormous, which has, not enormous, it has, it has potential. It has. So I, th I think there are areas where the UK does make it, it has, clout and does make a difference, uh, even while we, we've made life much more difficult for us in the trade and general regulatory. You know, just on the artificial intelligence, everybody's sort of mocking how the, how the UK can even believe, you know, the UK's got a very strong AI mm -hmm. centre. Um, uh, and um, 
you know, it, it's, a, it's an area again where, where uh, you know, we'll worry about all the, all the AI Armageddon stuff. There's a lot of very practical stuff going on uh, on a daily basis where, where the UK sector is quite strong. So, uh, you know, p part of the problem we've all had is we're all, you know, I suspect most of us on this panel, very gloomy about decisions that have been taken and the, and the shenanigans in Westminster. Um, and, but if we're going to get over that, you've got to um, also look at... And the just final point, you know, most countries, when sort of evaluating where they are, would start with geography. And our geography is just great. <laughs> You know, compared with a lot of other countries. Except for weather. Hmm? Weather's, weather's getting better. All right, OK. Look at, look at wine growing, moving from France to, 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 to Kent. Uh, um, you know, an island uh, off uh, with very few countries threatening it, hmm. in a not a bad climate, it's not a bad place to be. And you don't have to believe all those maps that put us in the middle of it, because we know plenty of maps would have us right in the corner. But, but, the, but it's a starting point. Um, for, yeah. for the, for the long-term durability of the country uh, that, that's important to keep in mind. You're going to be sceptical, aren't you? No, not no, good. Well, good. a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, but that, that means some decisions are going to have to be made, and some of those decisions will be expensive. <laughs> and the problem with the carrier groups is those decisions were made, and they, I think, not good decisions. They've cost a great deal. And now, of course, once you, once you build things like carrier groups, you have to keep on... Um, repairing them, um, which seems to happen rather a lot, you have to keep on funding them. But what the decisions I think are going to have to be made, I mean, Britain is um, a leader in innovation and science. I mean, that, and it, it was, I think, um, I didn't agree with everything um, Mrs. Leedsom said, but I agreed with her you know, that Britain was able to respond very quickly on the vaccines. That takes investment, it takes planning. Yeah, no, and she said, you know, oh, there are all these Nobel Prize winners in the UK. Future Nobel Prize winners are not going to come here or they're going to leave, they're going to be hired somewhere else because they can take their teams with them, they can travel more easily, they, they get government funding. And, you know, the, the, the government has not yet, there are all these promises about how um, the Horizon funding would be replaced, it would all be fine, that hasn't eventuated. Um, the other thing that worries me, and, and again, I think Britain has a tremendous advantage, you have a huge amount of knowledge here, um, partly because of your history, partly because you've had a very good foreign office, and partly because of your universities, you do actually know a lot about the rest of the world. Um, which Germany doesn't. I mean, Germany has had a problem, I think, in its foreign policy. They, they haven't needed to have a foreign policy for so long, and they're now scrambling to try and build that sort of capacity. But that has to be maintained. And what's happening to the universities is very worrying. Um, you know, young student, young, promising young academics can't get jobs. Um, university departments in history and politics are closing down in some cases, which means you're losing a, the bodies of information. So I do think, um, you know, there has got to be, if, you, if Britain wants to maintain its position and, and yeah. I think fill this very useful role of knowledge, information, technology, then it's got to make conscious decisions about how to do that. Yeah, I'm going to add to that, and I think in this audience I hope there'll be sympathy, that you know, the study of modern languages in the UK, both in schools and in universities, is really dropping disastrously. PM on Radio 4 last week had a sort of German special um, session during the middle of the programme just to try and encourage people to learn German, so I think with the new, uh, German, with the news that you know, the numbers of people taking, I think, A-level German in the UK is now smaller than it's been uh, at any time in, 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 in history. And, uh, uh, there are other examples of that. I mean, more people learning Russian might be quite useful at the, uh, the current moment. Taking the um, wider point also about sciences, I mean, one of the things that I think most people in startups and in universities will say is that Britain is still really very good, certainly proportionately very, very good indeed, at innovating in terms of many areas of science and technology. The problem is scaling up. Yeah. And if you look for in very, very different ways, both the United States and China have obviously had immense success in terms of scaling up particular sorts of scientific discoveries. The United States has done it up to now by a, as it turns out, very um, powerful combination of private sector involvement and certain directed um, state funding through things like the National Science Foundation. China, of course, has the state take much more of a directive role, but what they both have in common is that they have very, very large internal markets in yeah. which the commercial and military yeah. aspects can both be uh, explored. Britain doesn't have that. We used to have a larger market available to us, but I believe something happened to that, that recently. <laughs> That's nonetheless doesn't stop 
innovation being possible. South Korea and Israel are good examples of how that could be done. But there has to be a lot more creative thinking. I mean, going back to the question of, of, of finance, of where pools of venture capital come from. And again, the story in the last two years about attracting investment to the UK in these areas has not been a very happy one. That's one of the things that a post-Brexit um, UK government has talked about facilitating and being smarter and nimbler on. It doesn't seem to have happened so far. But without that, the innovation and scaling up you know, ideas and dreams of a uh, succession of, uh, of, of, of governments, I think it's a you know, Labour thing as well as Conservative, will be very, very hard to actually realise in practice. And I suppose it's worth adding that in an era of IRA and the EU talking about autonomy sure. in both economic and military terms, it's even more difficult for the UK if, if those continental yeah. sized economies turn in. The one thing I would say though, I mean, just to suggest it and see what you think, is that one of the things Brexit did was it forced us to have to think about this. I mean, you know, we had a very quiescent foreign policy for many years pre-2016. And what, one of the things that Brexit did was it provided a political imperative to show that the UK had a role, which meant that we had to think it through, and out of which came the integrated review. And actually, a lot more activism and probably a lot more thought about this than we'd given for many years before. Do you think that's fair, or do you think that's just appallingly over-optimistic? <laughs> well, you yeah. know... I think the integrated review, review is pretty good. I mean, I thought it, it mm. was... Uh, we, we all know why. <laughs> uh, one of our colleagues uh, being influential in it. Um, but it, I think that I think you're right. I mean, you can't escape, and I, you know, that's why I obviously what, the correct, what Margaret and Rana say is, is absolutely right. You can't escape the investment issues. There's lots of things where we're in a good position, but we'll, we'll, we'll lapse. It, 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 uh, and you know, money scarce at the moment. This is not unique to the UK. Mm. I mean, it really isn't unique to the UK at the moment. I mean, there, there are problems in most developed countries. The US has been prepared to go far more into debt than most because of the role of the, do the dollar yeah. um, the, the, than others are able to. So I don't think I don't think I mean I don't think we should assume that we're just sort of uh, traipsing along well behind everybody else who's zooming along. The, unfortunately. Even you know, as I said, even China is that the economy is struggling a bit at the moment, and that's you know, it's better for everybody if you've got a buoyant international economy. Yeah. So, um, to, but but that, the fact is that unless we invest in the ways that, that have been mentioned, then we then we will struggle. We'll just have a bit of boldness in government. I mean, the real problem, and we've got another year or so of this, is the paralysed government the, the, yeah. that, that just doesn't isn't able to take the sort of big decisions bold decisions that sometimes you need. This is the priority, we're going to put money into it, we'll see it yep. through. Yep. It just it just finds that seems to find that really difficult. Anything to add on that? I, I only just I agree with a lot of what's been said. I, I the only thing I'd add is without sounding I hope too much like a stuck record, is actually doing a few things at home that um, project you as the kind of country people want to be interested in and mm. want to emulate to some extent is a good idea. Mm. Um, and if I could sort of just mention one thing, because it sounds domestic, <laughs> that I think is very, very important for our international reputation and credibility as an international partner, it is peace in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just remember long before Brexit, or I, I'd even heard the word Brexit, as you know, touring for um, the coalition government as their deputy national security advisor in, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Somalia, in Yemen. What changed the conversation was not, we're brilliant, we've got special forces, we've got intelligence agencies. We, you know, people did care about those things, and as Lawrence said, they knew they were better than most others. What actually got you an audience was we've also made mistakes and we've made them right. Mm -hmm. And we have managed to find ways in which multiple identities can be managed within a policy. Mm. Interesting. Margaret, you don't have to. Uh, just to say, actually, I think if I had to pinpoint very briefly, one thing which makes Chinese diplomacy not as effective as it might be in the wider world is that the inability so far of China really meaningfully to talk about mistakes made and amending those mistakes, which 
as you say, you know, the UK on occasion has got good examples of that. The US at its best is able to do that, not always, but it's notable. And really, Chinese diplomacy just doesn't have the structures that permit that, because of course it uh, suggests that error might have been, been made, which uh, is, is, is something that's very hard to do publicly. I think that will stand in the way of Chinese negotiations and peace broking in, in a whole variety of areas. Mm. Every year when we plan these conferences, we think, okay, let's keep the panel short and leave them wanting more afterwards. And then every year when you chair these sessions, you think, Christ, we should have had another half an hour, 45 minutes, because there's so much to do. So I'm afraid we've come to the end. But if you could just join, we have 15 minutes for coffee break now. But if you could join with me in thanking this fantastic panel, I think we'll agree. Thank you. 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 Thank you.